I want to welcome our viewers to this uh, webinar. And I'd also like to thank um, Paragonics for hosting this series of webinars and for investing their time and energy into driving innovation in our field of transplantation. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Dave D'Alessandro. I'm the surgical director of the heart transplant program here at MGH. I'm also the associate chief of clinical operations for cardiac surgery. I'm going to give you a brief review of some of the impacts that the allocation changes had on the US heart transplant practice, and then a brief summary of some of the um, specific effects that we've seen uh, on our program. As this audience knows, the heart allocation policy for adult heart transplant in the United States was changed by the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network, effective October 18, 2018. The new system was designed to improve access to donors for those patients that were most at risk of dying, partly by providing broader sharing of donor organs. We went from a three-tier system to a six-tier system with more granularity. In February of 2020, the OPTN published this one-year monitoring report. What they found in comparing data from right before to right after the policy change was not necessarily unexpected. As you can see, the number of organs procured from a center's donor service area dropped by almost half. Those organs procured from zone A, which is less than 500 nautical miles away, nearly doubled. Those procured from zone B, which is between 500 and 1,000 nautical miles, nearly tripled. You can see that there are also increased procurements from zone C, which is more than 1,000 nautical miles away, but these numbers remain small. The same data shown differently in this middle panel, you can see a flattening of this distance curve with a very similar number of organs available, but coming from farther distances. Now look at the effect of organ ischemic time, which is displayed on this rightmost panel. Concerning, we observe a 13% increase in median ischemic times and fewer organs enjoying this less than three hour ischemic time window, which as we all know, these hearts tend to do very well. This is industry data, which examines the relationship between center volume shown in the y-axis and longer ischemic time defined as more than three hours shown in the x-axis. And as you can see, when including data from 2018 through 2021, there's this very linear relationship. And it certainly appears that centers that are adding volume are doing so by adding cases with longer ischemic times, which very likely means that they're traveling longer distances to get organs. And I'll show you some examples of this in a moment. And so it appears that if you aren't going, you probably aren't growing. But what is the consequence of adding these cases? This is an often cited paper that was published by Killick and colleagues last year in JAMA Cardiology. They performed an interim analysis comparing changes in the US practice before and after the allocation policy change. And in their analysis, they found yes, weightless mortality did in fact go down, which was the design of the new allocation system. But our recipient profiles also changed. Recipients at the time of transplant are now sicker. They are more often in an ICU and mechanically ventilated. They are almost four times more likely to be supported with a balloon pump and five times more likely to be supported on ECMO at the time of transplant. And they are considerably less likely to have a durable LVAD. Despite these higher acuity recipients, our travel distances have gone up almost 80%, resulting in an average organ ischemic time that is now 37 minutes longer. And strikingly, the post-transplant survival was reduced in their analysis. And this finding remained even after risk adjustment. Well, that is the aggregate data, but what is happening at the individual centers? My good friend Ash Shaw and his group recently published their results at Vanderbilt, which I believe is currently the largest heart transplant program in the US. They compared their pre and post allocation change, roughly 90 patients in each group. Again, we see a nearly threefold increase in ECMO, they don't report their balloon pump use, but you can see that their VAD-supported patients are down 30%. And 
And they have cut their wait list times almost exactly in half, which again is the design of the allocation change. But how have they done it? They've done it by traveling further, almost 40% further than in the previous era. And now looking at the recipient data, you can see that their average bypass times are longer. The warm ischemic times are a bit longer, perhaps reflecting higher acuity patients or more difficult operations. And the total organ ischemic time was just under three hours, is now 37 minutes longer on average. Is this clinically meaningful? Their data suggests that it is. All of these clinical metrics are trending in the wrong direction. But most strikingly, their incidence of severe PGD has gone up nearly threefold. 30 day and one year mortality are not statistically different, but perhaps this is only because their numbers are not sufficient to power this. But it certainly looks to me like a clinically meaningful difference. And so to summarize their data, they see a significant increase in travel distances, a corresponding significant increase in total organ ischemic time, now averaging more than three hours, and a concerning and statistically significant uptick in severe PGD. And so in their words, changes in heart allocation resulted in shorter waitlist times at the expense of longer donor distances and ischemic times with an associated negative impact on early post-transplant outcomes. Here's another similarly sized US transplant program comparing their pre and post allocation change data, roughly similar sized cohorts, 80 and 90 in each group. Again, we see a large increase in the use of temporary MCS with a five-fold increase in the use of balloon pumps. Their average organ ischemic time increased by 26 minutes. What is the consequence? Well, it's not certain, and these numbers are not statistically significant, but in this small sample size, they appear to be experiencing more overall PGD and more severe PGD. Well, what's the clinical significance of PGD and what causes it? Last year, the group at Pittsburgh published this analysis in ASIO. They looked at nearly 450 patients transplanted at their institution between 2015, sorry, 2005 and 2017. Previously, ischemic time of less than four hours have been considered safe, and a longer than four hour ischemic time is a known often cited risk factor for PGD. In their retrospective analysis, the overall incidence of PGD was 16.5%. They found that each 10 minute increase in organ ischemic time was associated with a 5% increase in the odds of PGD. And in their patients, PGD was associated with a marked increase in hospital mortality, which is apparent in this Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And so in their words, in referring to PGD, quote, our data identified increased ischemic time as the most important risk factor. Small incremental increases in ischemic time were associated with increased risk of PGD, end quote. And so it's not just the more than four hour ischemic time organ that we need to be concerned about. Well, MGH has not been spared from these changes and the effects on our practice have been similar. Here are the changes we have observed in the in-region versus out-of-region organ acquisitions, comparing 2017 and the most recent year. As you can see, the majority of our hearts used to come from our state here in black. And now this is, flipped on its head. Nearly three quarters of our patients are now imported from out of state. And this is a trend that continues to evolve. Notice that last year, more than half of our organs came from over 500 nautical miles away, as shown by these blue hues. And this trend, disturbingly for us, appears to be increasing over time. But with the right tools, acquiring parts from a greater distance can be to a program's advantage. And it can allow a program to either grow or at least maintain present volume. And perhaps the outcomes don't need to suffer. Here are our center results comparing recipients whose allografts were transported on ice versus those that were transported using the Sherpa Pack cardiac transport system. While these are not matched cohorts, they certainly appear similar with respect to donor characteristics. As you can see, most of the patients in the Sherpa group were transplanted in the post allocation era. 88% versus 44% of those transported on ice. Going along with that, we see more use of temporary MCS and ECMO in the Sherpa group, similar number of balloon pumps and less implanted VADs. 
Also in the Sherpa group, our recipients are older, seven and a half years older on average, and they are getting organs that are coming from farther away, 222 miles further away on average. And these organs are suffering as a consequence 30 minutes of additional ischemic time on average. Despite this, in our Sherpa cohort of patients, we are seeing what appears to be less PGD, although these rates are quite acceptable in both groups. But what is significant is the ICU and length of stay are, is, is shorter for both of these in the Sherpa group. 30 day and one year survival is favorable in both groups, not statistically different. And you can see these graphical comparisons of the various metrics in the bar graph on the right, all of them favoring the Sherpa group, although to be fair, not statistically significantly different. And so during a period where individual program data and collective data suggest that post-transplant outcomes are suffering, perhaps at least in part due to longer increasing ischemic times, we are seeing, if anything, improving outcomes. These same observations bear out in the multi-institutional and multinational guardian registry data, which, is a, which as you've just heard now has more than 1,000 patients. This registry compares outcomes in Sherpa pack preserved hearts compared to standard cold storage. And what's exciting is that in the latest data, we now see a survival advantage in the US cohort in patients transplanted with the Sherpa pack versus those transported on ice. And there's a substantial cost savings to these improved clinical outcomes. We have a manuscript in preparation. We have not seen a significant change in mortality in our patients. However, this is from our most recent SRTR report. And as you can see, our one year and one, our one month and one year patient survival trends better than expected and trends better than national average. At a time when we are reliant on traveling long distances for organs and very commonly experiencing ischemic times in excess of four hours. And so a few concluding remarks, the new allocation system has resulted in longer travel distances, longer ischemic times, higher observed PGD, and lower observed post-transplant survival, at least in the aggregate data. We've seen favorable results achieved with a controlled hypothermia using the sherpa pack cardiac transplant system. And our center and registry data suggest this system provides superior cardiac preservation, allowing longer ischemic times with favorable clinical outcomes. Thanks for your attention. I think we're gonna take a few minutes to answer questions. Thank you very much, Dr. D'Alessandro. That was an excellent talk. For those of you in the audience, this would be a great time to submit any questions to the, the question and answer panel, uh, which you can, be, can be found at the bottom of your screen. Um, to get started, I'll, I'll maybe ask a, a quick question. Um, you know, during this talk, I think it was excellent. Uh, it was interesting to see how the allocation change um, allowing for uh, uh, recovery of organs at a greater distance. Uh, could be used to, to drive program growth, but it also strikes me that you may be able to evaluate a, from a larger donor pool and either be more selective about donor profiles or consider more aggressive uh, uh, profiles of recipients. Can you speak to beyond program growth, what other program goals could be addressed through greater travel distances with the new allocation system? Yeah, I, I think um, the competition for local organs has gone up is what's happened. So th there's two ways that you have to transplant your patients. One is to make your recipients higher acuity. So you could use more ECMO, use more balloon pumps, use more impellas, those types of things to move your patient up the list. Uh, or uh, you can travel further to go get those organs. But as you can see in our experience and everyone around the country is seeing the same thing you don't have your choice of local organs anymore. They're getting picked, especially if you're close to New York and you know, big regional centers, they're swooping in and taking all those organs. So to maintain volume and certainly to grow volume, you gotta go further. So there's you know, ways of doing that. We're gonna hear some other presentations on this webinar of how to do it. But you know, we've grown, you know, um, we've, we've gotten less concerned about you know, those more than four hour ischemic times in our experience using the, the Sherpa system is that it, it protects those hearts quite well. And so we've not had problems extending our, our travel distances as I've shown you. Um, 
that we, we just got a question in. Did you include DCD hearts in that Guardian data you presented um, uh, in your data? Yeah, the answer to that is no. This is um, ex vivo perfusion is not in Guardian, at least right now. It's a repository for hearts using the Sherpa. Now, Michael may say differently. It, it, it could be that you know some of the DCDs are going on Sherpa and that data is going in there. But the data that we've submitted and the data that I've looked at in Guardian is only standard uh, uh, brain dead donors uh, transported on the Sherpa system versus ICE. Is that correct, Mike? That's correct up to this point, um, but we'll be hearing from Dr. Urban uh, from uh, Nebraska, who's, who's starting to work on DCD hearts with Sherpa Pack. So uh, that may change in the near future. Um, we also had a, a question, and, and I'm curious your answer as uh, the, the principal investigator for the US principal investigator for Guardian. Uh, now that it's up to a, a thousand patients, uh, we do get this question from time to time about um, a, a randomized trial. I'm just curious, comparing the, the volume that you're of, of patients and power that we're being able to achieve with Guardian versus uh, randomized trials, which generally have more limited numbers. How do you how do you see that? And I think also one of the, the challenges there we've seen we've heard from other uh, past webinars is is equipoise yeah. uh, for a lot of our investigators. I, I think the the time for a randomized trial for this may may, may have passed. Um, as you know, to do a good randomized trial, you have to have equipoise, and to show a difference, you're probably going to need to include uh, only those that are longer ischemic times. Uh, I don't think I any longer have equipoise in that. I, I did when this came, first came out, I would have been very happy to, uh, to, to submit patients to a randomized trial. I, I don't think I would anymore, at least for longer ischemic times, and it, and it may not um, make a difference for the shorter times, I don't know. But I think the best we're probably gonna get at this point is registry data. And the registry data is pretty compelling. And the more data that comes in there, the more compelling it is that there is a difference. Excellent. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your talk. Um, I think we'll move on in uh, respect of time uh, to Dr. Shudo, Yasuhiro Shudo from Stanford University.